All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this second roundtable on cross-border commerce. I'm Stefan Spankers. I'm one of the co-founders of PimVendors.com, and I'm very honored to have you all here on this um, well, late afternoon with at least here in the in Utrecht beautiful weather. Um, I'm honored to have a great panel standing by behind the scenes to discuss this um, this topic with us. And before I give them the floor, I have some housekeeping for you. If you have any questions, um, send them in the comments on the live stream. So on LinkedIn, on the comments uh, or on YouTube where we are live streaming as well. Um, send your questions our way. Um, the speakers or Glyn um, will pick from those questions and answer them, um, take them into the conversations <clears throat> or not. Um, if you have any technical issues, um, please comment or send me a quick message on LinkedIn and I'll try to reach out and, and help you get that sorted out. With that out of the way, though, um, let me hand over the microphone to our moderator, Glyn. Um, Glyn, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks, uh, Stefan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, us for what is the second of a series of three roundtables on the topic of cross-border commerce. Um, series is, um, came about after a webinar we did last year on the topic of selling across borders. Um, discussion highlighted how incredibly broad the topic actually is, and we needed a much deeper investigation. So here we are uh, today. Just to uh, recap where we were before, the first instalment was about preparing the journey. And in that, we delve into, can you afford to not go cross-border? Does cross-border internationalization, internationalization make sense for every organization? And how can you prepare your organization? And we split out people, processes, and systems. Today, we're focusing on achieving efficient cross-border commerce. And before I ask each of our panel members to tell us a little bit about themselves, I'll just give a very brief background on myself. I'm a, a company called Retail Insight, which is a website of opinions and insights on the retail sector. So I have a, a particular focus on technology and digital developments. We also produce various reports and host events. And it's also a pleasure to be invited to host uh, and chair roundtables for other organisations, such as this one. And certainly over the next 50 minutes or so will be particularly interesting because in our discussions today, we've discovered cross-border commerce is something that many companies do without actually realising it. I think it typically gets pigeonholed in. It's all about crossing international borders. But in reality, it also encompasses regional borders in the same country where we come across things like different cultures, even in the, uh, in the one single territory. Uh, uh, before I say any more, I'd like to end a panel and I'll ask each one of our our experts to briefly tell us where they're from and just give a little brief introduction to themselves. And starting, we have Harold. A little, little intro. Yeah, thanks, Lou. I'm Harold. I'm a senior consultant at Via Medici. We are a uh, PIM, CPQ, and MDM vendor located in Karlsruhe, that's in the southwestern part of Germany. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Harold. That's basically it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Sorry for, for interrupting. <laughs> for now. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you'll have plenty of time, don't, 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 don't worry. Uh, a little brief intro, please. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of Lighthouse Integration, and we are um, doing large projects for integrating, for example, PIM systems for companies. Thank you so much, Dagmar. And Rupert? Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, Absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I'm with InRiver. Um, we're one of the leading vendors of um, PIM solutions. We've got about 1,500 brands using the platform. Um, I've got about 15 years experience in PIM and DAM localization. Um, and I've worked with brands, agencies and retailers over the years. Thank you, Rupert. I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, a new member of the panel, Sanchit. Thank you, Glenn. This is Sancho Grover. I am a strategic account executive with the Precisely team, uh, working specifically on the Anaworks BIM, DAM, and MDM product. Um, I'm based here out of Chicago, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Sancho. I think we've got a, a great variety of people who straddle a whole load of us here today, which is a uh, nice bit of context. Uh, during this session, we will look to specifically cover efficiency and PIM as a tool or a goal. Uh, we we'll look at the complications and where cultures can collide and also process optimization and why it is important in a cross-border setting. 
I mean, the, the structure's exceedingly simple. I'll basically be throwing a variety of questions at our panel, but we'd also like to hear from you out there. Uh, so please type in your questions, whether that be on YouTube or on LinkedIn. I look to bring those questions in as and where, uh, where relevant. Some specific questions that might not necessarily be, be uh, for the conversation may well be answered in the background by Stefan. Right, moving on, uh, looking at the first of those three sections, efficiency in PIM as a tool or a goal. Basically considering, should we actually focus on efficiency alone? Or are we talking about quality versus efficiency? I think the reality is from our early discussions, I think it's not about expecting a flawless process with your cross-border activity. It can't be undertaken with a cutter approach. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And to set the ball rolling, say, Harold, the, the quality versus efficiency. Well, uh, I think all of us have experience in the past. I think we have more than 100 years of experience combined. And I think we know and we have made so many mistakes cooperating with our customers that anybody who is new into the cross-border journey will have to come up with their own mistakes. I'm pretty confident they will do that. And we all had some of our experiences between this this tension of are we going to to uh, focus on creating the perfect cross-border approach which is going to last for the next decades or are we going to focus on efficiency and um, well uh, Glim, you mentioned the the cookie cutter approach um, this is definitely not going to work so um, one gets easily tempted to draw upon the experience previous experiences uh, but usually uh, you have to find the right balance, in my eyes, between perfect quality. Sorry, I have to sneeze now. I don't. And that was that was live, by the way. <laughs> so you have to find the right balance between efficiency and quality. And uh, there's always the question, how much effort do you put into the planning uh, before you even start the project and then waste a lot of time? Uh, on the other hand, you don't plan at all. You don't try to anticipate what is uh, coming up and uh, you waste a lot of effort in the aftermath by mm -hmm. by learning from your mistakes mm -hmm. thank you um thank you harold and dagmar what how do you with the, with the certainly with the customers you've you've dealt with how have you balanced that quality versus efficiency or, or certainly come to a conclusion on that uh, that consideration yeah i have a very good example from my experiences and that was when we implemented for a a car company, a car manufacturer here in Germany. And uh, the efficient idea was that every translator and translation agency was supposed to work into the system and translate right away. And that was not going to work because they had, just as one example, a 70-year-old translator for the Italian language. And that person um, printed out what he had to translate, wrote it by hand and then faxed it back into the office so instead of going for efficiency and finding another italian translator the company decided this person is so good in translating they he knows our mood he knows what we want so they put a person uh, aside uh, receiving the faxes and then typing in what this person had translated and they did a similar thing for their English translator. And so it's always this balance between the efficiency that you actually can achieve and where are you willing to cut down on the quality? If Thank I you. may interrupt at this point, you just um, inspired me because on, on a meta level, um, this was a, a cross-border initiative as well, because mm -hmm. the, these guys were crossing the border between different work paradigms. Somebody who is uh, used to work with his hands and he was, was writing on paper and not online. So that's yeah. crossing borders as well. Correct. Thank, Thank you. Correct. For, for younger viewers, I think you might have to Google fax machine. Yeah. <laughs> unless, unless uh, Rupert, you fancy in the question also definition of a fax machine while you're at it. <laughs> oh, I couldn't possibly remember. I seem to remember they have cogs in and steam comes out the back. Apart from that, I don't remember. Um, but for me, this this you could talk about this this question for a long time. So I'd take this back to how are you actually going to measure success? And success, I would say, I'd try to get it revenue based. 
Um, and sometimes I think it's good to sacrifice quality and do things in a dirty way. So, for example, can you get out to a new market very quickly? If it's, for example, Amazon, eBay, which are new markets or a new international market. Um, so always looking for kind of quick wins. Um, in terms of the cookie cutter approach, um, I quite favor standardization. Uh, so I'd like to see if you can keep 80% the same, perhaps replicating what you've learned from um, other projects or from your integrator, and then making 20% adaptions to the processes that are bespoke to your company. Um, what I've found in the past is that every company thinks they're different in terms of how they're operating around content, people and processes. But actually, when you drill down to it, there's so many similarities. And I like to focus on the similarities. And if a company says, you know, we want to do this differently, I always challenge that to say, is this a cultural thing they don't like change or do they really need to change so I think if you keep some of those standardizations, do it dirty, you can get quick wins. And I think dirty could be a quick pilot. Um, I think there are some areas where you really do need to focus on quality, and that's around compliance, regulations, and safety um, for international markets. Um, just a, a few of my views there. No, thank you. Rupert, I know we are going to come on to the, the to about what levels of customization might well be acceptable. So I know you've given an 80 20 there, but we'll, we'll I'll, I'll pass that one around the panel shortly. Sanchi, what's your view on the quality versus efficiency uh, debate? Um, well, there's a there's a lot of aspects to it, right? I mean, it, number one, every company wants to be both efficient and have like great quality content. There is no doubt about that, right? But it also depends on where they are in their maturity journey. If it's a company that's just starting their footprint in the e-commerce and they already have great content, which they were maybe producing in a, in a print format or whatever have you before in a different language, for them, the first step is to how to get the PIM operational, for example, or how do I get my content online for, my, for one market and start there? Having said that, overall, once you start using a software or any technology in your in, in your geography, that does not mean that the same technology and the same process is going to be working for or is going to work for other geographies as well. I'll give you an example of that. Um, a, this was a, a leading manufacturer of beverages, which I'm sure all of us have had at some point in our time. And this is going back in the early 2000s when I was an intern at one of those companies over in the Middle East. And what they were doing is they wanted to launch that, that product, which was only in the North American market previously in the Middle East. Um, and they said, well, we already have the marketing content. We already have collaterals that are printed out. Why don't we just you know, make that change, translate the language from English to Arabic, and we should be good to go. We can get the you know, ground up and running in 30 days. On the surface, that is great because in the U.S. that was a great approach. I mean, they already had spent years to master their marketing platform, their film content, their product content, their you know, posters and all that good stuff. One small mistake. So the, 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 I remember clearly there was a hoarding which you know, was out there in the, in the major highway which showed like, there's a man in the desert walking, he's tired, he gets the drink, he's now energetic. This is all perfect messaging and there's all everything written down and, and, and good stuff. One thing people forgot is that in Arabic, people don't read from left to right, they read from right to left. So think about the messaging at this point. If you drink this drink, you are gonna be lethargic, you're gonna be tired, right? So you have to think about, it's not about just translating the content. It is more about how am I translating in context to my market? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's where I am. Like the efficiency part is there, but first you'd have to operationalize yourself and then look for the efficiency. That's what your journey in the maturity model should look like. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I'd second a couple of those points there, are, I'd, I'd sort of second really. So I think starting with a minimum viable product approach allows you to establish those foundations. 
also agreeing there that content is so important, adapting that for different markets um, it, to sort of engage the audiences. And the other point I'd, I'd make there is different markets have different sales channels. And I think in some territories, WhatsApp is absolutely critical, whereas in other, other markets, it's not. So that, that's also about different channels to focus on as part of the strategy. I would like to second both of you, uh, Rupert for the 80-20 approach and, and Sanchit for uh, the, well, the, the inspiration in terms of risk management. So watch out for tripwires when you enter different markets, like reading from right to left. So that's a <laughs> crucial one. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. You have to kind of understand the audience. And a lot of times when we, you know, when we speak with our customers, and before becoming, you know, a person in the sales and product management, uh, taking this job, I was a consultant. Where I used to do these implementations. And a lot of times people will say, well, I want to do a project for my e-commerce, which is global. I'm like, okay, well, you got to start with one single context first, because when you go global, you have to think about mm. 1,500 different things. And you cannot do that from day one. You have to start small. And then you piece by piece take other geographies because it's so much beyond just translating the content. That's more or less what Rupert also said with the pilot. Um, I've done both approaches in the past in projects and the ones where actually a pilot was used for uh, one small segment of one market in one country, for example, worked much better and gave a very good feedback, which could then feed into the next mm -hmm. rollouts. And uh, on the other hand, the Big Bang, which we also did in some projects, is a huge amount of effort for a huge amount of people. It, it can work if you have a good project management behind it, but it is, um, yeah, quite stressful. <laughs> There's another right. point but that's ha perhaps been having mi 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 oh, and um, there's another point here that's perhaps been missed off. So my view here is planning and planning and more planning. So scope it out, work out your priorities. And I always use the analogy: every one hour you spend planning and and working out what's going to work and what's not going to work will save you ten hours in project when you're picking up the pieces. So true. To really evaluate the market, look for the quick wins, get a quick win, and that will also help you with your um, positioning internally when you're being put under pressure on ROI. Thank you. Yeah. But don't, don't stop planning once your project has started. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the reflection part starts. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's crucial yeah. to, to the long-term success of these initiatives. How are we, are right. we saying... Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm just, uh, are we just uh, moving on to the next sort of one to pose to you? The uh, thing, however you choose to define efficiency, it can always be achieved with a PIM. I know we're, we're, we're all, each of you is coming from a PIM angle. That's, that's pretty much always the case with cross-border activity. Um, I might be a little bit more neutral because I'm not coming from a PIM company. <laughs> so it strongly depends upon the number of products that you have. I've seen implementations where it's all about um, uh, driving the marketing material and driving the, um, the cross-border, the languages, the localization, and you needed a system for that. Uh, the PIM part was rather small. Um, because there were only, let's say, in, in this example, there were three models of their product and each model had a few accessories and that was it. It was a very, it was a handful of products and the products were managed inside the, the content management system and that was entirely possible. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah. as soon as you have, and now I think the gentleman will uh, agree <laughs> with me, as soon as you have more than, let's say, uh, 20, 30 products with all their accessories and color um, possibilities mm -hmm. and so on, um, yeah, a PIM is essential. Uh, allow me to, to rephrase. So yeah. obviously all of us, so maybe with the exception, exception of Dagmar, we would appreciate that everybody purchases PIM, even <laughs> if they don't use it. But um, I, perhaps we should say it's not, not necessarily about 
PIM, it's about mm -hmm. connecting people with and, and um, bringing information to people. And one of the tools to, to do that could be a PIM. And in many cases, it is, is a PIM. It doesn't have to be a PIM from scratch, right from the start. But when it uh, the product information extends a certain complexity and a certain uh, size, <clears throat> then a PIM is highly recommended, not to say mandatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mm. I, I guess, yeah, we're yeah. starting, so. And all, mm. I was going mean, to say, although, oh, go ahead, please. Go, go ahead, uh, Sanjit. I was going to say, like, although no one system is key to a cross-border success, um, there's different systems that come into play, whether it's your e-commerce platform, your ERP systems, your PIM system, DAM systems. Um, they all have a key play in making sure their operations run successfully. One thing that I would still say, and not that because I sell PIM, is that the PIM becomes that center point for you from an organization perspective that can actually tie back your different geographies. So, for example, a lot of times when we go to customers, you see that for each geography that they are doing business in, they have separate ERP systems for that geography. Sometimes we even see separate e-commerce platforms. Um, as Dagmar said, you know, the translation flows for these individual uh, markets for individual companies in different markets could be different based on their location. So in that regard, the PIM becomes that one uh, point or the hub in the center that actually can connect and talk with all these different ERPs, all the different e-commerce systems, maybe can have even different processes for gathering, collecting information for different regions in a, in a separate workflow, for example, right? So it kind of becomes important that you have one single system in the, in the middle that helps you with collecting that information that is going to go out and help you um, with your e-commerce back, uh, with your e-commerce cross borders. With cross border commerce, there's a lot of different things attached as well. Beyond just the, the content, the marketing copy, you also have to think about the regional um, uh, you know, requirements, law requirements. Maybe there is certain um, regulatory stuff that's needed for items in it Italy versus item in Switzerland, right? I mean, now you're going into cross uh, regulatory bodies. How, as a company, can you put in governance that can say, well, this is my corporate governance, but this is my regional governance that I have to fulfill in order to make a product sellable in this particular market. So that kind of helps you tie back into your data governance organization is if you do not have a single system, you can't do everything in an ERP system. ERP, you'll miss out on the messaging part because the ERPs are more operational data versus the PIM is more of your product information content that you are using to sell the content. And that's why I think PIM is an important piece of it. But without having an e-commerce engine, maybe sometimes without having an ERP, not having a CMS platform, the PIM, just having a PIM is not gonna solve that problem. Thank you, Sanji. Just before we I'm move gonna, on to I can... the next, so, so, you, um, I, I can give a short, a short and sort of sweet answer to this. So, I mean, I sort of agree with Sanchez there. I, I see a PIM as a middleware or glue to manage all people, processes and content. And the answer to, is it always efficient to have a PIM? I would say no, but a company really knows when they need a PIM. A company knows when they've outgrown Excel and file systems. So... Mm -hmm. It should be pretty clear to an organization whether it's time to migrate and move to a PIM. Yeah, and it's the single source of truth in the middle, as Sanjit said. Mm. I think that's the word that uh, describes mm. it best. Yeah. yeah. Just before we uh, move on to the next block, I was just wondering, uh, Rupert said about the 80-20 rule in terms of the level of him your views on that would you look at the same the same levels yes i i totally agree i mean 80 20 and the the pareto principle it's always um yeah it's known it's it's used 
And whether it's, um, let's say, 75 and 25 or whether it's 85 and 15, that's the cultural thing of the company itself. Mm -hmm. So if you are going cross-border, um, how mm -hmm. detailed do you want to get in that first step? Um, how necessary is it for your product? Because it's also whether you are selling a very generic product or whether you are selling something which is quite specific, uh, where you then decide how do how deep do I have to get to to achieve what I want? I want to have a positive market entry, and that's the goal. Um, yeah. So eighty twenty, yeah, it's numbers, but uh, you can achieve quite a bit with um, uh, going towards efficiency and not losing on quality, and the same the other way around. Mm -hmm. I, I might add that if you shoot for 100%, you will Very never briefly. start your project, you, let alone, you let alone finish it. I think Glyn has a... Sanjit, I think, um, I think uh, Glyn was pushing, putting the floor to you, Sanjit. He seems to be freezing a little bit. <laughs> I'll take it over. Um, Harold, were you, I know you were saying, uh, making a point. Do you want to continue or do you want me to take over? I, <laughs> yes, Angie, I, I, I think I, just, just take over. Okay. 80, 20 or whatever percentage you want to put as a stack nurse, that's a number that is or, your organization. There is some proof points around, around 80, 20 me methodology and you can go about that. I feel like for every organization that has thought about doing this, they what they care about is probably data integrity and data governance first, right? I mean, yes, they want to implement a system or they want to go across borders, but when they think about going in different geographies, the first thing they think is like, how can I keep my data sanctity intact, right? How can I make my data in, in, intact that is being used overall? And Whenever starting a, a project, whether that's e-commerce or PIM, I always suggest my customers, yes, pick a geography where you are going to be first starting out in. However, do not forget about the other geographies when you begin with. Meaning in a discovery phase, you should also always consult and know the nuances that other geographies bring into your data model, to your data governance, to your quality rules. Because if you do not, then retro in the retrospect, you know, going back and changing that, might cost you actually more money or you might lose money based on things you did not discover at the beginning. So it's important for you to understand the, the full scale of your cross-border e-commerce. You may not start in every country that you want to sell in, but you should know about each of them. Um, a lot of times, and probably others have seen even, you know, Dagmar, in your integration methodology uh, projects, probably you've seen is like people think about what am I doing today in my process? And when they implement a student system, well, this is how we do this today. And I want to do this again, the same as yesterday. That's, that's the wrong approach. If you wanted exactly what you were doing before, then you don't need a, a, a system, right? Then you don't need, what you probably need is a process Hello? change as well. So people think just about the technology. People do not always think about the process changes. Um, and even like the people change part of that. When I say people change, maybe there are certain experts in your product content field, but there are no um, experts in your data governance field or data integrity field. So you kind of have to fill those gaps as well, but you have to start from the beginning. And wherever you are in the maturity model, that number could change for you, whether it's 80, 20, 75, 25, 70, 30, that will change based on how your people process ex at the company exists right now. And then you can adjust them as you go forward in expanding other geographies. But you kind of have to have the, the solid baseline to begin with. Great, thank, thank you, Sanjay. You can... I'm having some slight technical issues. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I, hopefully- I think we, you if can... We can. Oh, if we, yeah, so, sorry, I think I'm in. If, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, complications and where cultures can um, collide. Um, just looking at what complications can organizations encounter in the um, inter internationalization process. I'm thinking in terms of, obviously we've got cultures at stake there uh, and dealing with change management and we've got processes, again, could be different cultures and systems. 
systems. Um, Dagmar, do you want to take take a look at w what complications are likely to be encountered, uh, especially from a cultural mm -hmm. perspective? The number is uh, nearly endless. <laughs> and <laughs> what, would be, what would be the key one? The, the key one. We'll get a few new ones. Uh, just a few examples when you have translation and you translate a specific word of your marketing message from one market into the other, it can go terribly wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to go into details. It did yeah. go terribly wrong in the past. And uh, uh, just from the from the cultural aspect, um, I had an implementation where, um, and I don't know whether that's typical for um, France or for the French people, but uh, they were always giving back their uh, feedback and their changes, their requested changes at the very last minute. So everyone was uh, waiting to go to print and because France and the French language was part of one printing group and only the black plate was changed for that marketing material, uh, they all had a hold up because the French people gave their feedback too late. And uh -huh. I don't know, as I said, um, this does, might not reflect on the French. It was perhaps in the company. I don't know. Uh, but uh, it created quite a stir. <laughs> I think it might have been the French, actually. Yeah. I think it might have been the French. Yeah, yeah I think we're agreeing and the same, with the same with the US. The US always wants to have something special. You can't put the US into mm. a group with anyone because the US is its own group. So also that happened. And again, it might not reflect upon everyone in the US, but in the in the projects that I was involved in, there was always something special about um, the approach to the U.S. market, obviously because it's one of the biggest and so on, but also because the, the companies inside the market, the, the subsidiaries, they had their own, I don't know, spiel of how they wanted to approach the market and they did not follow um, any recommendation coming from the European parts. Mm. <laughs> So it is cultural, uh, yeah. uh, and I'm not talking I about think... real big um, challenges like the Chinese market, Japanese, the Arabian was already mentioned. So all of these markets, they have their own difficulties. Yeah. I, I might... you, Dagmar. You, you mentioned the U.S. today. We've got Sanchez, who is, is the U.S. What's the cultural um, complexities and complications you've, you've felt, um, Sanchez? I think it's hard to genericize for me, like, you know, that is true, that this is what everybody in the U.S. needs. But I think to some level, mm -hmm. you're right, Dagmar, right? I mean, I worked with companies where I had a customer who had offices over in, you know, in the U.S., in Japan and in, in the U.K. It was a juggle, right? Because the, now imagine the difference in culture where there's a, a Japanese team. They're pretty structured. They wanted to know things from the get go. Um, they have a discipline of doing things um, versus the people over in U.S. and U.K., they're probably a little bit more um, on the fly. They are open to changing directions maybe much more swiftly than a Japanese market would, right? But that's how the culture is. It, it, nothing wrong with either or approach. It's just the way people are. Um, I, having said that, but yes, U.S. is always a special group because of the way the business is running. Maybe they're headquartered here or whatever it might be, uh, which have special requirements. And I always ask this question to me, and I don't have an answer to date. Should, before we even start a project or a sales, should we just recommend or have a change management that is put as part of this project? A lot of times change management becomes... <clears throat> comes after the fact that we are going to implement a cross-border solution doing in, 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 you know integration um, and it works fine to, to a larger extent because they're able to get people onto a new software talk, talk about new technologies however getting the initial buy-in where everybody says well this is the way I do it this is the way I do it you it's hard for a consultant or a third party to come in and say well this is the way the software is going to do it when we don't even know why they do it that way. So understanding the why is behind the way they're doing things. Maybe this is the system limitations. Maybe it's a cultural thing. A lot of different aspects can, can touch into this, but it's a, it's a great thing to bring that up front and talk about those 
discuss that because when the solution is being designed, whether it's integrations, whether it is BIM, ERP, MDM, e-commerce, whatever it might be, right? For cross-border union, all these things, it's important for you to get to a common ground. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it's always going to be customizations you'll end up doing. You're going to end up customizing the software so much that in the end, you're going to break it. And then you will say, well, mm-hmm. now this BIM is no more upgradable from my current vendor because we didn't so much customization. So we have to move to a different platform or start from mm-hmm. scratch. So you mm-hmm. save, you can save okay. yourself that, that, that part by doing a great discovery over years, obviously the a software might become over complex or you might outgrow the needs of the software. That's a different story. Thank, thank you, Sanji. Rupert, I think you there's a, there's, yeah, there's a key point here. So uh, it's really, really important to get buy-in um, from all parts of the company at the start of the process. So even when you're laying the foundations of the project or even looking at different solutions, it's important to involve people at all levels within the organization because you can even have some users that are quite low down the organization that have used a system for years if they don't like something or they're not bought into it they will effectively be disruptive so that's really important the other thing that i've seen on some projects is competition between um different geographical entities uh, and this typically has been competition between the uk teams and the us teams where both of them want a different system both can think they can do a better job have better processes and i think that needs to be joined up before a project really gets into the meat otherwise if you have that those cultural those fundamental issues in the project um you're you're going to get pretty big challenges or even a failed project. Um, I think some things that I've also found is that organisations massively underestimate the complexity of this and the nuances of different markets. Um, I think Dagmar Dagmar maybe touched upon the point of giving, um, empowering the, the other markets, so allowing them to make decisions or at least making them feel like they're able to make more decisions about the content and the strategy um, Mm -hmm. whilst also maintaining your overall brand strategy and your your e-commerce strategy as as far as you can specifically in the beginning there should be at least one person possibly two or three that verifies what you are planning for the local market so even though Mm -hmm. you have your complete uh, brand outlined you know exactly what you want uh, check it with someone local who knows the market and uh, don't go into a market without that. I mean, it's very mm-hmm. obvious, but I've seen people just ignoring that simple fact and it went not, not good. <laughs> I, think, I, think that's where pen can I might, I might <laughs> even say this, this calls for some quite kind of awareness officer, making sure that uh, everybody's aware of these things. I would like to share uh, some, some kind of uh, chicken and egg question. Um, imagine a, a customer in the B2B world, uh, um, a company, they, they produce stuff for, for the manufacturing industry. And uh, in the German market, they their customers insist on having a printed catalog and they spend loads of money and effort on a very, very complex catalog, highly expensive. Their Italian colleagues were asking, why on earth do you still use a printed catalog? What's what's the point? Why do you, do you spend so much money on that? Let's rather work on something more contemporary. And the answer was, well, our German customers want this printed catalog. The question I would ask is, why? Are they using the printed catalog? Because it's the same branch in Italy as well as in Germany. So basically the same customer type. Are they using the printed catalog because uh, they don't have an alternative or is there they're a cultural thing to having a printed catalog? So what's the, what's the chicken and what's the egg? And yeah. just this this type of initiative uh, consume too much money, which uh, prevents the company from moving moving on. I think you beat me to it, uh, Harold. I was just going to say maybe it's time to 
for the chief culture officer to be to be brought in. <laughs> but I, I, I think the, the point I think Sanjit brought in in terms of uh, change management, I think change man management clearly when you're dealing with cultures yep. is an absolutely enormous area. Um, that that printed yeah. catalog. And, 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 um, go ahead, Rupert. The, the, the printed catalog one is is really interesting use case and even in the British market if you look at different demographics I know I've worked on one project where the printed catalog was absolutely critical in for a tooling manufacturer hardware manufacturer yeah. because the target audience had used this for years for decades it was in a specific structure they knew how to use it, and if you took that catalog away, they wouldn't continue to buy from that from that organisation. They'd simply go elsewhere. So that printed catalog was effectively a massive differentiator in creating brand loyalty. That's the point exactly. So speaking of cultural change, would in this case mean you would have to include the customers in the change. Mm make it easier for them to follow along, come along with the change. Actually, in interestingly, I think in the DIY sector, even though I, I know it may well be where you're referring to the paper catalog, a lot of those those users of the paper catalog were actually the same people who were actually still putting their orders through on mobile phones. They were actually doing click and collect on mobile phones, but they, they were used to, traditionally used to, actually having a physical catalog, even though what they, it's not as if they were averse to using technology. But um, yeah, I think that's it. Well, no, another point on that. So the when you actually go into the stores, we both know which one this is. The the young staff that are at the terminals with the computer are using the catalogue because the catalogue is actually mm. because of the structure. It's it's as user friendly as the computer. Yeah. No, but I, I think yeah, completely agree, Rupert. I think Harold, yeah, it's an interesting point, isn't it? When do you you bring the at what points do you bring the customers into this, into this thing uh, where you're making the decisions? It's an interesting point. Yeah, especially when you say, well, the, uh, there's a certain amount of money. You uh, a certain let's call, talk call it the budget, and mm. how do you spend the budget when one country says we don't want the printed catalog and the other one says we do want it? Mm. Uh, how do you split the budget up? Yeah. Right now, thank you, thank you, Harold. Yeah, just jump to the, the final block, which is process optimization and why important in a cross border setting. Um, just thinking in terms of optimization of processes that could include things like translation, transformation, mapping, etc. Uh, and clearly, there's a whole can of worms and a massive discussion here. Uh, uh, I guess it's, I guess it, it's massively important. Um, you know, in terms of where are we, where are you seeing examples where optimization is working working well? Um, Rupert, do you want to dive in? Um, so I think going into new markets and different languages, it basically causes the workflow to explode in complexity. So you've got the different language variants, perhaps some product mm. variants. You've got different connections to different international commerce platforms, Amazon, and so on. So I think it gets to a point where this is impossible without a tool. Um, yeah, I'm, so both, both on a technology level with the integrations and on a people level to manage those processes, I, I think it's absolutely essential. I should have actually in the, in the question, you know, we, we are the, the based upon violatory cases that might goods, we've got food, you know all of these things. you can't miss these these components can you mm -hmm. um no you're, you're right and I, I think that there are different standards in in each uh, country on that, things like that electrical and... just continue rupert i think glenn is breaking up again uh no that's no problem i'll just just the, yeah, do, um, do, so where was I? Yes, yeah, so, so I think there are, there are different standards in in each country. If you look at electrical, if you look at mechanical, if you look at allergens, if you look at so many things, and there are also different industry standards. So I think that is not possible to track in um, an Excel spreadsheet. So once you've got the different languages, the different industry standards, you've probably made your product data 
a hundred times more than it was when you were just targeting a single language in, in a single market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Thank you, Rupert. One thing uh, I yeah. Would, yeah. yeah, one thing I would like to add to what uh, Rupert said. Uh, Rupert, you said that the, in, the implementation of a system is very important when you want to get more efficient. Um, based upon the experiences, I know that uh, specifically the, uh, let's say, what, what is usually called the cash cow of a company, uh, they define the rules of how things should be produced, how marketing material should be produced, and they define the workflow. And that is not always the best. So being able to question everything um, in that mm -hmm. um, first stage while you are yeah, in the discovery, while you are going forward, um, maybe in an agile way, um, being able to question everything and anything is extremely important because sometimes it is really like, oh, we've always done it like that. Let's continue doing it like that. And uh, uh, you're spending a huge amount of money and uh, in the end, it's not necessary. Great. Thank, yeah. thank you, mm -hmm. Dagmar. Uh, Harold, do you want to, to uh, take on that one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we talk about process, you, uh, everybody has some kinds of association to, uh, to it. Like uh, we think about BPMN flows and so on. And um, I, I'm not always a big fan of having the, the, um, the holy process rule everything. But, <laughs> but <laughs> you can handle it only handle so many X spreadsheets. And mm -hmm. at some point, the, the crucial thing, the, the most benefit I see in, in processes is transparency because workflows, the way you do things becomes transparent. It, it becomes explicit. And that's when you can start uh, streamlining it. That's when you can start optimizing it. And to me, that's, that's the main point of um, thinking about processes, including the organization, because making processes transparent, making them explicit, reveals the change with the organization. There's a couple of things that I'd probably add to this. So the first point is to challenge the status quo. Oh. Any tools. Can I think we maybe have some yeah. lag. Harald, uh, now you just broke up a little bit. Yeah. I broke. What are the last words? What were my, my famous last words before I uh, was killed? <laughs> but you were you were building on from from the uh, the excessive use of Excel spreadsheet. All right. Okay. I try to remember what I what I just said. So um, it, it only goes so far to handle a, a plethora of, of spreadsheets and uh, the benefit of uh, making processes or workflows the way you do it, um, modeling it. It makes things transparent. It, it reveals the um, the need to optimize. It re reveals the need to change for change within the organization. And um, that's one of the key benefits of, um, first of all, making, making explicit, making them mm. transparent. Rupert said, if you start start your cross-border journey, it's not just one process. It's not just one sheet. There are different uh, regulations, different um, geographicals, dif different um, target groups. And there's just no way to do that manual. And, keep track of everything out of your head. Mm -hmm. There's you. a couple of points that I was going to, uh, um, uh, to add there. A double-headed question. Oh. What are examples where... Oh. I'm sorry, I couldn't <laughs> understand your question here. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, Sanji. Yeah, I, yeah. What are the examples where optimizing well and what are the risks organizations face during the optimization? Yeah, so I did a project um, probably from eight years ago where a company was trying to go implement an MDM solution and um, they were trying to do the right things to begin with, right? They were trying to kind of look at every geography that they were doing business in and bringing in the requirements from those geographies and then starting to design the system and implement the system. 
However, they were looking at it from a different viewpoint is they wanted to do a big bang. They're like, well, we are a global company. We just cannot afford to have one geography not be on this MDM system versus other geographies be because we don't want any geography to, to be left out and do it from the get go. The problem with that was because they focused on optimization and excellence to begin with while their maturity in the MDM journey was still on the lower end, the project became a failure. In the end, they were able to go live with that MDM platform in a span of three years. Is that an acceptable timeline to you? Is it possible? Yes. I mean, did they do it? Yes. Are they operational today? Are they efficient today? Maybe yes. But it took them three years to do that, right? So the question becomes, well, what are your organizational goals? And can those goals wait for three years to be able to to get there? Are you okay with that? If yes, then you know there's no, no harm in going big bang and you can take your time to, to do this. Versus I want to take a step back and say, well, let's do an OKR exercise with all these regions. Tell us individual region-wise, what are your objectives and what are, the, what are the key results that you are looking from implementing the solution or going cross-border? What are your, you know, in your understanding? And a majority of the times when you bubble these all up, you will find that every geography that you are doing business with every country, their objectives are going to be almost identical, but they're mm -hmm. identical in their own context. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes really easy from a, from a joint solutioning versus a, a cross border perspective is this is what is going to bind you together. So maybe there are going to be certain process changes, but in the end, this is the result you want. This is the result you will get. Along the way, there might be some changes that you have to accept. Certain things a different geography is doing, which is better than yours. You may have to adapt that. Certain things you have to let go because they don't fit in the, the, the whole framework anymore. So it's about people and how, they're, how receptive they are. But again, you cannot do everything on day one. You have to first try things out and then mm -hmm. go and expand in those regions. Doing a discovery is great, but saying that I want all those 1,500 requirements on day one, that's sort of foolish, right? Because you don't even know if that's, that phase one is going to work out for you or not. You cannot put all the eggs in one basket and then go from there. You just have to try this out first. Thank you, Sanjit. Uh, Rupert, or, uh, Dagmar, do you want to add anything onto, onto that? I think we were saying that examples of optimization working well and, and uh, what are the risks during the, um, during the, the, the process? I think I think um, I really second what Sanjit said there. So he's saying that there's a lot um, of, of people issues here. Um, and I, I think where I've seen the most success is where you've had openness at the beginning of the project and where all parties have been willing to listen, to change and to challenge the status quo. I think that's a really good foundation for success versus taking existing processes, existing ways of working and just throw them into a system, which is actually the easy option, but that also causes mm -hmm. failed projects. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rupert. One thing that I would like to mention, yeah, is that uh, if possible, don't do both at the same time. Don't implement a complete new system and um, uh, go into new markets. If you can prevent it, do one step after the other. Either you first go into the markets, because uh, obviously, I think, Sanjit, you put it um, very nicely, can you actually wait until uh, maybe an, a system has been implemented? Uh, is it worthwhile doing stuff manually first? Or if the system is the most relevant part of your future steps into other markets, other countries, other um, target groups, whatever, then do the system implementation and then conquer new markets. Try to not do both at the same time. It could work, obviously, but it needs a lot of flexibility to do so. And uh, larger companies, larger organizations uh, tend to be less flexible. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's always a constant well. battle between success and excellence, right? Do you want to be successful at what you're doing or do you want to be excellent at what you're doing? Because yeah. they're both that's different good things, right? Success, mm-hmm. you can, that's more strategic. Excellence is a long-term goal. Obviously, you should have that long-term goal, but you have to go with like smaller chunks and pieces, which is like, I want to get, get smaller successes, which are going to lead to the excellence, which yeah. organizationally I want across the borders. I would like to to add one aspect to that because I like it very much, especially when you said, well, this three year big bang project. And when we talk about large organizations, we also face the challenge to keep people motivated to to stay on track. It's a bit like traveling with small kids. Aren't, Aren't we there yet? And it's easier to have smaller successes on the on the the way to your to excellence. Mm-hmm. I and think that gives you the uh, chance to, to learn and to ev- evolve in your approach. Otherwise, you don't mm-hmm. give yourself the chance, chance to learn. Thank you, I think uh, this is where a, a minimum viable project approach can work really well. So you pick yeah. one business unit, one market, one channel, a new channel, for example, Amazon or eBay. You can get that up and running in a system very, very quickly with new processes and a live system that can effectively be a pilot to roll out with new markets. That can be a really quick win project, in my view, and can deliver great revenue. If, you've, if you're picking Amazon as a new channel, that's going to get you probably a revenue hit very quickly. Right, th- thank you, Rupert. Yeah. Anybody got any last thing to say? The children in the audience almost arrived at the end of the journey. Final final thoughts or any any example of an organisation out there which you felt has done particularly well in terms of organisation optimization of its uh, we've, customer we've, productivity. Yeah, we've always mentioned print products as being the the most difficult, and that is definitely the experience that we all have. So if you can mm. get away with it, perhaps no, you are starting. They are still a little. Should I continue? <laughs> <laughs> if you can get away with not um, putting a, pimp, uh, a print project into your mm-hmm. rollout, whether it's market or system, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. If you can get away with um, opening a new market on a completely digital level, for example, then um, that is definitely a good approach. Even if you currently think that your print product is absolutely essential, um, because that is, it's so much easier. And then coming back and rolling out the print part, the print workflow later, I think that is something that you can go into in phase two and uh, you already have your first success. Right. Thank you. Dagmar, Dagmar, to I, add I, to I, what, to, to, just to add briefly to what Dagmar said there, I've seen organizations focus too much on print it's become an obsession because of history. So when they've run the project, they've run it with print focus when it should have been digital focus and then the digital part fails. So that's a, that's a big issue I've seen as well. I think we, I've seen it the other way around. Sorry. And I'll take Um, it a step back. Focusing on print. Sorry, sorry, Sanchez, just to, to mention this, they focused on print, the whole print implementation was in place, digital was lost on the way, and then mm. the project failed because print got less and less and less important, so the whole system yeah. was then thrown yeah. away. Mm-hmm. Sorry, just to yeah, add to and, that. And I was going to say, I was going to say, I have a very different point of view, maybe not very different, but like a different point of view on this subject. It should neither be print focus, nor commerce focus, not ERP focus. It should be the your systems and the way you want your data to be should be really generic, agnostic to the systems, agnostic, agnostic to markets. It should reflect the true master copy of what your organization, your products want to focus on. And then everything else is going to fall in line because that's what the messaging comes in. You want to message us differently for print versus e-commerce. That's a messaging problem, right? So from a systems perspective, you kind of have to alleviate yourself from those underlying upstream and downstream systems. You have to think about, okay, well, what, what standard will make my, my data, uh, you know, sort of correct and contextual or maybe even correct only 
to be used across different contexts that can be reused again in different geographies. We, as a software provider, cannot tell you don't do print or don't do commerce, right? If that's what your business wants to do, that's what you should do, right? If, that, if you feel like that's where your money is going to come from, great, do that. But what we can always guide you is do not think about them as your only ways of defining the your, your strategy or your cross-border e-commerce platforms. Great. Thank, thank you, San. Uh, I, and with that I, said, I, go by precisely. It solves every problem. I think these, <laughs> these, conversa these conversations are all about coming to some conclusions, but I feel we've actually touched on something in terms of the print, whereby the whole new... Uh, new opening for us to discuss at some point in the future the uh, oh the gosh break. yes <laughs> but uh, anyway we with the time has ticked by and unfortunately we'll have to wrap things up at this point i'm afraid uh, i'd very much like to thank them for their terrific input at this round table i hope it's been informative to all of you out there who checked in this afternoon and that it's answered some of your questions around cross-border commerce also like to thank uh, and pin vendors putting this event together and as mentioned earlier, it is one of a series of three, and we hope you'll be able to join us for the final chapter, which will cover off the future of cross-border commerce. And on that note, I'd like to say au revoir, and fortunately with my few gremlins to, to cling on for dear life to the end of the process, and I will now hand you back to Stefan. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thanks, Grim, thanks. I, I mean, I have been selling in, in, in e-commerce and across borders for, I think, at least 10 years, actually, from the start of my career. And... Um, I'm really glad I could pick up some things today. Um, learning that output and quality sometimes trump processes and that you should allow the flexibility to have fax machines in that process. Um, that that might be the result of, of working cross-culturally. Um, and we don't have someone from France on the panel, but I think we should have someone from France next, <laughs> next time. Um, that in this world with augmented reality and dreams of virtual reality, that there are still valid reasons to keep working with printed catalogs, even with all the issues, um, at least on the software side. Um, and that working across borders and, and, and opening new countries, opening new regions is, is a, an exponential increase in complexity and something really difficult to, to judge, I think, beforehand. Um, and it's important to know that you can't have it all, right? You can't have full rollout in each geography. You can't have all your processes and tools adapted to the unique needs of a region. You can't have it all on day one. Um, so I think Sanchez put it real nicely. Um, it's success versus excellence. Like you can't have it both. Um, before I, I, I wrap up, um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the panel, um, each of them individually. And I hope to see you all next time. Um, and I also want to thank Glyn uh, for hosting and, and moderating this panel, um, like all the previous panels, and hopefully as well the next panel. Um, I would say thank you for joining us all on this cross-border journey and hope to see you on the next stop. Um, and with that, I wish you all a good evening, good night, or a good morning or a good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Good day.